You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that recall and and relate moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com, and those will, things will be in the no, uh, show notes as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guests for this week, Joanne Richards. So let me tell you a little bit about Joanne. Joanne Richards is a native Californian now living in Portland, Oregon. She has a thriving bookkeeping practice. She is the mother of a grown daughter and proud grandmother of three. She dramatically changed her life after six marriages that included abuse, divorce, and death. Husband Seven is incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. Joanne left the Mormon church after 30 years and never looked back. Through her many struggles, she found her strengths, gifts, and inner power and learned that dreams can and do come true. She recently published her first book, Midlife Magic, sharing stories of lessons learned and offering the hope that it's never too late to follow a new path and change our lives for the better. I love that. Joanne's side passions include discussing her personal UFO and paranormal experiences. We'll talk about that a bit. She is also an international speaker about the military's involvement with UFOs and extraterrestrials. Joanne, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I've been looking forward to this. Me too. It's great to have you here. And thank you. Even though we just met, I always start off any podcast with tell the viewers, because this will go out on a YouTube channel as well as on an audio. Uh, tell the you the viewers and listeners how you and I met. We met because I am in the Broadcast Your Brilliance boot camp with Nancy Jutton and one of the former members, James Hipkin, was in the group with me and he and you met at some networking function is what I was told. And he told me that he thought that you and I would be a good fit for your podcast. That is exactly <laughs> right to the letter. And I think I mentioned to you when we met that it was just one of those random things. It was a networking thing. And I just enjoy it so much. And I think my my most fun part of the networking thing, when, especially when there's a lot of people, is the breakout room. And so I got oh, okay. broken out with James. And, Hi, James. I'm David. I'm James. I'm David. David, I'm James. And, and we started talking and he did some website analysis and different right. things. Very cool guy. And then yes, he mentioned her name, and um, and I always pride myself and follow through. I always think if somebody's nice enough to recommend somebody, the least I can do is follow through and so forth. So, well, you have uh, <laughs> getting right to the Joanne Richards story. You have quite a colorful history, and I do want to touch on a couple a couple of things that I uh, mentioned in the bio. But sure. what I like to do sometimes, if we can, is start a little bit chronologically. So maybe not junior high and high school, but but maybe late teens, early 20s, and talk about that early journey as you started out in your life, which ended up being quite interesting to me, but how it kind of started out. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I joined the Mormon church when I was 10, 12, and so basically, you know, basically grew up in the Mormon church, and the, although my family wasn't members, my best friend's family was, So, you know, I was a very active member and just doing school and, you know, I was a, you know, professional student pretty much, but anyway, loved school, loved church, and you, you grew up being taught, and I grew up in the 50s and 60s, so the white picket fence, you know, mom stays home, you have a lot of kids, and you have this happily ever after family, and I thought that's what my parents had, kind of, except that I could see the dysfunction and I could see the unhappiness. But I thought, well, look at all these happy Mormons. They all have great families and this is the way to go. 
And so I thought, sure, you know, I'm going to go off to college and I'm going to meet Mr. Wright and we're going to have a ton of kids. And that's the way it is. And that's was the first of seven marriages. I've married five Mormons and they were all horrible husbands, <laughs> <laughs> horrible husbands. And you know, um, husband number two was not a member, but he committed suicide from abuse and, you know, mental illness. Well, I don't want to say mental illness, but, you know, emotional problems and stuff like that. And, and now I'm married to number seven and, you know, that has its own issues, but through it all, it's like, anyway, I left the church and, um, you know, just, just because you're, you are spiritual or religious, I've learned that, you know, that doesn't make a happy marriage mm. necessarily. You can't go into a marriage looking at like, oh, well, we're both, you know, Mormon, we're both Catholic, we're both whatever we are. Um, I, I assume that, well, if we go to the same church and we believe in the basic, the same basic things, then things are just going to work out. And we don't have to talk about all these important things that I've learned later in life that you really need to be talking about. And everything would be hunky dory. And then I thought, okay, and, and will that prove not to be true? And, you know, I also had the, the, the problem of, well, you know, there's no sex before marriage. So we didn't have long courtships. So that, you know, ruled out a lot of talking anyway. So that, that didn't help either. And then I assumed, you know, well, I'm, I'm just going to have a million kids and the fertility gods blessed me with one, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is fine. She turned, you know, she's a great kid. I'm you know, probably glad that I didn't have a million kids, but, um, but there we are. And so, you know, it's like been, I've run the gamut of all kinds of different problems in marriage. And I've learned a lot of things and I've changed my life and I've learned to look at what I want and what's important to me and husband number seven and I have had lots of time to talk because usually we're in a room with a hundred well at least a hundred other people mm. so you know we've had a lot of time to talk before we even ever got married and before we even ever got any private time together so talking has been a big part of our relationship that's neat and I think when I go back to married five six seven times what have you and you said horrible husbands. I, I look back on aspects of my life, and one of the ways I deal with it in a way that um, doesn't make me beat myself up too much, but which you all, I think, do at some point. What What do you think was at the top of the list when you mentioned those that series of husbands that that were the biggest lessons you learned? I mean, it's easy to say, well, you and I are nice people; they're not nice people, and that kind of thing. But I think I would think after four or five, you'd think, well, here's some key lessons that I learned whether it's about Joanne or about the selection process or them, but what do you think are at the top of the list of the top couple of things you learned from all that? Part of it was I needed to learn to set better boundaries. Mm. And I, I, you know, communication, communication was key. Cause again, we didn't talk enough before marriage. We certainly didn't talk enough during marriage about certain important things mm -hmm. and certain, certain key things, you know, well, how are you going to handle the money? You know, are we going to have kids? What's our spiritual practice going to be? That kind of stuff. And, you know, who's going to work? And just all these, these things that I kind of took for granted. Um, and, and in the Mormon church, you, you learn that the man is the head of the house. But you're also taught that you're supposed to be equal partners or help meets, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And the men I married what, were, well, I'm the head of the house, so you do what I say. Oh, wow. <laughs> Okay, number one, I'm a Leo, and I'm Irish, and I'm German, <laughs> so that doesn't always hit me well. I'm very stubborn, <clears throat> and um, I wouldn't say I'm a drama queen, but I'm very stubborn, and I, I, I have had to learn how to stand up for myself, mm -hmm. and I have had to learn that, um, no, you don't have to let him hit you again. And I should have called the police. I didn't have, but it, and it was worse on my daughter than it was on me because she was a toddler and he was hitting oh, wow. her. Wow. And, and I didn't have the strength to call the police or even tell my church leaders. So oh. I, I had to learn how to be strong in that respect. And I had to learn how to say enough is enough. I'm getting out. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to support myself, but I'm getting out. And that's the way it is. And see you later, buddy. Wow. And I also learned that 
if if the other person is not willing to do some work on themselves, you know, I can't be the only one that needs therapy. Right. And I've done therapy, I'm doing therapy now, but it's like, I can't be the only one in this partnership that needs therapy. Right. So when you tell me, no, I'm not going to therapy, it's all your problem. It's like, okay, bye. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and Joanne, do you think with, I, I'm just fascinated by the fact that Mormon, uh, the man is the head of the household and you know, kind of do it my way and so forth. How does that play today? Uh, I know these are in the past for you, but given the Me Too and all the things that's happened with equal rights and, and a lot of the stuff that's come up in the last few years, does that still work well in the Mormon church that, that the man's the head of the household and that kind of thing? I, I don't know because I don't have very many friends that are Mormons still. Oh, I mean, okay. the one friend I have that's still active Mormon, she also is one of my UFO friends. So, mm. but, you know, I think, I think for them, you know, they make it work because they're both strong people. They both have careers. And, you know, I know she knows how to speak her own mind, but, mm -hmm. and so they're both strong people and they're both good leaders. And so I, you know, but, you know, it, to me, a man and a woman can be equally as spiritual and equally tuned into a higher power. So, you know, I, <laughs> I could just joke around and say, well, the women should be in charge anyway. And, you know, we just let the man have this, but you know, that's just me being flippant. <laughs> well, and I, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I was noting, as I said, in the open about uh, tips and takeaways and so forth. And I, I already wrote down uh, set better boundaries, the communication, how it's going to handle the money, having kids, spirituality. Those are all really great reminders for people when you get into a relationship. And, right. You think it's all love and you know you're they're being intimate or whatever they're doing and oh everything's gonna be great but those are practical things that you have to deal with and stuff and so and and i also think there's something about societies i've been married four times and, and it's it's funny that we we just have this what society expects from us and right. so i when you first said oh i've been married so I'm like, oh really wow that's a lot <laughs> tell me why you know and so i want to know why not as much oh that's a high number or something but but contrast the the first five or six because you mentioned this is and we're going to talk about your book and the ufos as well but while we're talking about the marriage thing contrast those to the current marriage and some of the challenges there that are compare and contrast if you will to the ones in the past because you got a unique set of circumstances in number seven i do i do um and and i'll, I'll go back to my parents it's, it's interesting because the money thing um I'm a numbers person and that's just kind of genetic. It turns out my grandpa, my dad, they were all accounting people. And if you know, for female listeners out there, it's like, you know, my, I thought my parents worked together on paying the bills. And when mm -hmm. my dad died, my mom didn't know a thing about paying the bills. I'm going, mom, you, you guys were sitting there paying bills together. Oh yeah. He just let me put the check in the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, so one of my goals as a bookkeeper, I'm not trying to get off tangent, but one of my goals as a bookkeeper is to help some of my female clients who have suddenly found themselves in that situation, you know, suddenly we're divorced and my husband handled all the money. It's like, I don't ever want to be in a situation again, where one of us is handling all the money stuff, even though I may be the one paying the bills, you know, I still want the husband to know what's going on. And, and it's funny, because like, even my current husband's, you know, his, his dad earned all the money, and gave his wife an allowance to run the household. And I was teasing my husband, I said, well, you know, if you get out of prison, it's just not going to be that way. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and he's very old school. So I think he thinks it's going to be that way, because he oh, he's had the capacity to earn way more you know, he has earned way more in the past through the military and stuff than I've ever been able to earn. But I earn a good living on my own now. And it's like, well, I don't know how exactly we're going to handle it when he gets home. But um, it's like I keep telling him, it's like, you may not tell me everything, but there are certain things, you know, I need to know about. So it's like this can't, the money part can't be a huge secret. You may be not tell me all that you have, you know, and that's on you. But um it's like there has to be a lot more communication than there might have been in my past. Now, with him being in prison, it is kind of, it's not, it kind of, it's just weird. Um, and this is a whole chapter of my book. It's like, I am the primary, I am the only breadwinner. You know, he has a job at prison and he maybe earns $30, $40 a month. Oh, okay. 
and he has a hardworking job and he's he's got a really important job and he's about to run the whole optical lab at the prison you know, they oh, make wow. glasses for inmates and medical patients and stuff and it's a huge industry but he's always had a really good job but that money goes to pay for like whatever he needs to buy at the canteen and you know small stuff mm-hmm. and even though i or his his other family members will buy quarterly packages for him um, to, to supplement that he does earn a little money so that he can buy stamps or, you know, a, a treat or, or something, who knows, right. you know, so, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Um, so we have a house in Northern California that he grew up in. So right now, you know, that falls on me to make sure the house isn't falling apart and, and, oh, to sure. keep, you know, keep it not falling apart. So, um, I've lived there for, I lived there for 20 years or so. And right now, you know, somebody's watching it for me while I live in Portland to be near my daughter during COVID. Mm. And, um, so, but, but it is, it is strange because I was like, okay, honey, another tree fell over and it's going to cost this much, a uh, honey, the sewer line just broke and it's going to cost this much. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's, it's been very interesting and it wasn't until um, now that, you know, it's like I'm, I'm retirement age. I should be able to retire right now, but I can't mm-hmm. because I didn't start saving soon enough because I thought, oh, here's the other, here's the other um, myth that's like, oh, you know, I'll just marry somebody who can take care of me for the rest yeah. of my life. <laughs> well, that's I, know, I don't think you're out. alone on that. <laughs> and I didn't start my retirement fund until I was 60, which is mm. way too old to start. So right. anybody out there start putting money away when you're 20, 30, 40, yeah, such, even if it's 50 bucks a month. That's such good know, advice. Such you know, good advice. One and, less Starbucks a week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's all it takes. So Joanne, do you have a sense of, I don't think I talked to you about this last week, uh, about when he will get out or tentatively or how that all works or target dates or something? His sentence is life without parole. Mm-hmm. So technically he's never supposed to get out, but thankfully, uh, things are so bad in California that, and the prison system is so overcrowded and so poorly run and mismanaged and people his age with his health problems cost the state a lot of money. Oh, he, He's costing the state between 80 and a hundred grand a year. Oh my Lord. Wow. And that's just him. Mm-hmm. And he's, what am I? He's 68. He's almost 69. And he's on several medications for different oh. issues. And you know, so it's like, let's let you get out of there. Let's put you on Medicare or, you know, I'll get you insurance. Let's, you know, it's like, let's do something. And, but the governor is realizing that things have to change somewhat. So except for people with life, you know, without parole sentences, they are starting to look at, okay, well, if you've been in prison this long and you're this old, you're probably not a threat any longer and let's let you go. Oh, or if you, you know, if you're, and if you're older and you have health problems, let's let you go. Mm-hmm. They haven't applied that to people with life without parole census. So who knows? There's also a lot of lifers who are applying for commutations so that their sentence gets reduced to something to life, you know, like 25 to life. So they can start having parole hearings. Mark has applied for that. I think you said three or four times now, and they just keep ignoring him. I mean, they've been ignoring a lot of people, so it's not just him. Right. But, um, you know, so we have a couple avenues. He does have lawyers in the background that are constantly looking for ways to, you know, what's the best way to, to get him out of here. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I don't give up hope. You know, yeah. Like I've been saying that for 20 some odd years, you know, when I first met him, he thought, oh, I've got a lawyer working on this and I should be out in two years. I go, oh, I can do two years of this. Oh, interesting. And his lawyer frauded him and many other people in the state. So he's been disbarred. So, you know, two years has, we've been together 20, almost 25 years now. So, wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one thing I'm thinking is you were talking about that, Joanne, just to the average listener, uh, viewer, what have you is, I don't even know how to ask the question in a sense, but, but what's an example of something that might surprise somebody you're so closely associated with it because of Mark's time and the 25 years and 20 years and then the fraud over the attorney and being, and he's working on an optical, making glasses and things. What's one or two examples of something that might surprise people about being in prison and, the, and how you've seen it, that the outside person just casually looking at it wouldn't necessarily, might be surprised to hear. 
surprise regarding the inmates or the families? Yeah, maybe either one, because I just think there's just a couple of things you said. I thought, oh, wow, I didn't know they made, you know, lenses and, and prisons and things oh. like this. And I just think there's probably a lot of misinformation because I guess percentage wise, the average chunk or percent majority of the population doesn't go into a prison. So I just think there's got to be some things that you found out that like, oh, that kind of surprised you that were maybe different than the outside world sees. The good thing is that some facilities do have good educational programs. Like San Quentin has a whole college program right there. Oh, wow. Uh, some, some facilities have different prison industry uh, job things like Mark's in now. He's often, before he was doing that, he's, he's always been a clerk of some kind, mm -hmm. you know, run the person's paperwork, done the computer stuff. But things are things are not managed well. And, you know, I don't have a lot of good things to say about the people who work at the prison. Wow. Um, wow. And we won't go there. But mo I have met several that are compassionate and kind. A lot of them are very just power hungry and mean. And, you know, so on the one hand, my husband has to have a totally different persona when he's around the guys and the staff than he does with me. He can come out and see me and he, you know, he tries to relax and be the nice husband. And we have a good time talking and laughing and sharing stories, but, and it's not that he has to turn into this gangster when he's back with the other guys, but you do have to stand up for yourself and you can't act or look like a weak punk or they'll oh, take advantage of you. And both the guards and the staff and the, the other inmates will take advantage of you. So, I mean, you know, and he's he's former elite military, so he can take care of himself, oh, wow. even as an old man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and he is recognized as a very highly decorated military officer. He's like the highest ranking military officer at his particular prison. He runs the veterans group. Oh, interesting. He, he teaches classes. He, you know, he, a lot of people look up to him and he's a good worker. So, but, but again, it's like, if, if you, you know, if you weren't a criminal before you went into prison, you, you very likely will be one when you get out because oh, you learn all these bad habits yeah. or you, you have to learn ways to survive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I know Mark and other guys, you know, they try to look out for, you know, kids who, just through some bad break or through, you know, nobody that they had to look up to or poor education, you know, they ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time and ended up in prison for mm -hmm. years. Yeah. And so that's, you know, horrible. And a lot of it is, um, you know, you have a drug problem and you end up going to prison because you tried to rob a store or whatever, you right. know, it's like, so he's seen a lot of guys who, if they had just had better examples or better opportunities on the streets, they they would have never ended up in prison. Wow. So such a fine, such a fine line. It just yeah, the right. And, you know, and I probably grew up with, you know, in the mindset of most people, it's like, well, if you're in prison, you must be guilty. Well, not everybody's guilty. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, a lot of people should be there. You know, and we'll sit in the visiting room and you go, okay, well, that guy's killed like seven guys, and that guy's the head of that gang, and that guy talking to his mom, he like runs this drug trade. And it's like, mm. it's like, oh, okay, well, they all look very nice when you're in the visiting room, but they're not all nice, and some of them do belong there. But a lot of people do change, and a lot of people um do look, you know, have a really good family life. And I see when I go to visiting, I see all these loving families. Now I've seen husbands and wives just start having a fight. I, I've seen them break out in a fight or just sit and totally wow. almost ignore each other. Wow. Um, yeah, so I, I've seen kind of everything there, but most of the time when you're in visiting, there are boundaries and you don't start fights and you don't start, you know, gang fights or racial fights or anything when you're in visiting, there's a like a unspoken rule. And you just, I love seeing the dads with their kids and, you know, gives the mom a little break every now and then. Cause you know, here, go play with your dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And the dads love that. And it's funny because uh, Mark will tell me, you know, he's friends with, you know, a lot of old time bikers and such. Cause you know, at our age, we're just sitting around talking about our grandkids, you mm -hmm. know, who's learning to ride a bike, who's, who's potty training that, you know, right. right. Oh, you that's know. so it, you know, not everybody is as, you know, they may be tough guys, but they still have a good heart. 
Yeah, and, that's yeah. that's kind of what I was looking for. I think on that, just that maybe yeah. you can see it from the outside, and and just just out of curiosity, how often do you visit? Before COVID, I would visit him every weekend because mm. the prison he's at now is only an hour from our California house. Oh wow! He's he's been, and I don't move every time he moves. I stay put. Mm -hmm. he's been as far he's been in southern california so then i would only go like once a month because it was a five to eight hour drive depending oh, okay. on where he was at uh he's been also like two or three hours away and i would still go at least one one day of a, you know i'd go every weekend just and it would be an all-day thing mm -hmm. and even even with him only an hour away it's like i get up and you got to go there and you have to have appointments um but still you know it's an hour away then you wait and then you visit for a few hours and then you go home. So you, you've exhausted a whole day and I'm exhausted when I get home because, oh, you know, I've just put all this energy into visiting my husband for a couple of hours and. <sighs> yeah, I bet you mentally it, it takes a toll. And well, yeah. let's, let's segue over into something else that talks about stories and sure. lessons learned and everything. And that's your book, Midlife Magic. Talk a little bit to the listeners about uh, the genesis of the book and, and what's included in the book. All right. I, like you said, I, I, I used to speak a lot at UFO conferences before COVID, and I was at a conference, and I'm always talking about my husband's work in the military regarding UFOs, aliens, weird, weird stuff like that. True, but weird stuff. And this lady I hadn't met before, and we're now good friends, and so this was, I don't know, 2012, I think. She came up to me and she goes, oh, so like, when's your next story coming out? And I said, oh, you know, Mark will be writing something anytime. Oh, no, no. When's your story? It's like, what? She goes, yeah, when are you going to write your story? Mm. So she recognized in me, even though, because she's very psychic and she didn't, it's like, she didn't know me yet, but it's like, she recognized in me that I had a story to tell. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I don't have anything to say. It's like, I'm nobody. And over the years, she's so, so how's that book come along? How's that book coming along? And and I, well, I'm sitting at a conference and I'm writing notes and I'm writing notes. So basically I, you know, finally put the book together and it is, it's, it's a memoir, but it's, you know, it talks about my childhood and it talks about my philosophy, philosophy on getting married and why marriage was important to me. And then each husband has a chapter and then Mark's got like two or three chapters. And for him, it was more like, uh, you know, how we got together, what our story is and a chapter on what it's like to be a prison wife and then how he introduced me to the topics of, you know, UFOs and aliens and witchcraft and magic and fairies and stuff like that. And so then I have a chapter on, you know, my personal paranormal stories, my personal UFO sightings, my experience with the fairy realm and my spiritual magical practice and how I use my intuition to protect myself things like that. So it's kind of like it's the book has a split personality, but it's the journey of my life. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from each marriage, and then how I started taking care of myself. And it's like, I found, even though my husband introduced me to these topics, I have embraced them and thought, oh yeah, this is, I love this stuff. And I want to share more of that with other people. And it's, when I met Mark, I, I just realized I didn't need the Mormon church anymore. So I just stopped going. It's like, mm -hmm. I'd rather visit you and talk about all these cool things we're talking about than, than going sitting for hours in church. Right. But I, I have a spiritual life and I have a spiritual practice it's just different than what it was and I already had some paranormal experiences before I met Mark so you know I love being around ghosts and talking to them and I talk through a person that channels a dead person and then we bring in people I want to talk to so I'm very the the other side is very near and dear to me and I get a lot of good wisdom and counsel from uh, people on the other side, including my parents, Mark's, well, I haven't ever talked to his mom, but his dad, you know, some of his, cool. his one you, of his former partners. And Joanne, do you remember your first paranormal experience? I do. Thank you. I, uh, husband number three was a funeral director. Mm -hmm. And we went, he was, we were in Southern California and we had to transport it a body of a deceased elderly woman to Northern California for her graveside ceremony. And I think there were like two family members that were there. Mm -hmm. And so number one, we're driving up and then stopping the van and taking a nap in this with the casket. It's like, okay, well, this is weird because we couldn't afford a motel, but we get to the graveside and I'm standing there 
and he's doing the little service and I just feel this presence and it's like oh I think she's here mm. this is so cool and it's just like this tingly feeling I get and just so reverent and I just oh, I think I think she's here and it's not like I said that to anybody I just knew that it was her and she was really glad we were having a little service for her and wow. I was kind of think I was talking to her just you know without saying anything out loud so that that was my first one and I, I would have only been in my early 20s wow and, and then I had an, another one I remember when the his sister's mother-in-law passed and we were living in Ohio at the time and I sang at her funeral so I was in the front of the chapel but I remember I just knew that her spirit was like hanging out at the, the top near the ceiling at the back of the church. I just knew she was there and, you know, looking over everything. And that was, that was really cool. And then I just kind of forgot about it until I met Mark and I started doing other, doing other paranormal stuff. So. Well, and also, and specifically too, I think a paranormal kind of, it's kind of umbrella over a number of different things, but talk a little bit about the UFO. Cause you mentioned that when you and I met, sure. and I think that's really cool how that's been because I've always been the belief that how can there not be UFOs and right. other life and so forth, but, but tell the listeners a little bit about a couple of those experiences. Sure. And I will just say, it's like, I didn't grow up believing in any of that stuff. I watched Martian movies and that was it. Mm -hmm. And after, and Mark didn't start out our first few dates with, Oh, you know, I used to be involved with the secret space program. And, you know, I saw UFOs as a kid and aliens and, you know, it's all real. It's like, over time, he had me read some stuff about missions that he'd been on. It's like, oh, you, you were out in space, huh? And wow. you, you were around all this stuff. And after we'd been together several years, and every time I travel anywhere or just go see friends, he's always saying, well, just look up. And by this time, I'd already believed in UFOs. I just hadn't seen any. And then one time I went to Phoenix to visit some friends, and we're taking a walk, and I'm looking up and going, ladies, I don't think that's a star that's just throbbing, blinking at us. I think it's a, you know, a UFO saying hello. And they, yeah, yeah, I agree. And it wasn't a super far away star. And then I come back and I visit Mark and I go, hey, there was this thing and it was just like throbbing, you know, hello. And he goes, yeah, that was probably my friends just keeping an eye on you. It's like, okay. Mm. And, and then another time, and I've seen UFOs like with night vision goggles. I've been on sky watches with groups and you can see things far, far out there. And another time I was driving to see Mark and I'd have to leave early in the morning. And I'm on the two lane highway between Marin County and Sacramento. And again, it's, it's pitch black and there's this big shiny object in the sky and it's, it's shiny and then it's dark and it's shiny, then it disappears. And it was either cloaking itself or, you know, it was doing something with the light. But I go, uh, I think your friends were saying hello to me on the way there. And he's going, yeah, they, they were. And then my favorite, and I've had a few others, but then my favorite one, and I can't, I think I shared this with you, but a couple of years ago when I turned 65 and it was our wedding anniversary, the same, it's on the same day, we were having one of our two day visits. And he always, at certain times of the day and night, he has to go out from the apartment, you know, just across the little patio to an outer door and be counted by the staff. And it was time for that. And then he was stayed out on the patio and I'm sitting there watching TV and he's going, oh, come out here. It's like, okay, what? And look up and it's like, there was the hugest triangular shaped UFO I have ever seen in my life. And it was made maybe a thousand, 1500 feet above us. Wow. And, and yes, there is an air force base right near the prison. So that's, that can be kind of common, but it was going so slowly. I could see the shape. I could see the red lights. I could hear the whoof, 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 the engine or whatever you mm. want to call it. And then it looped back around and did it twice just so wow. I wouldn't miss it. And I go, that's not one of our craft is he goes, yeah, no, I go, that's one of your friends, right? He goes, yeah. She just wanted to show off and say hi to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, he knew who it was. He knew who was flying it. And it's like, Oh my gosh, I can't. It's like, what a great birthday present. <laughs> so it was like, who, who else could say they've celebrated their 65th birthday 
you know, with a personal UFO sighting. So, would you, Joanne, would you say that people being around that for a while, the paranormal and the UFOs, do you think there's more of an acceptance of that now, maybe than 20 or 30 years ago? Would you say? Is it, it almost seems like it's more accepted now, at least to me, my thinking. I, I, I do agree that it is. There are a lot more people. There's a lot of people that are showing up at conferences and events and want to talk about it. A lot of people have experiences and they're more willing to talk about it. I have spoken a couple times at a conference that was held on an Apache reservation in Northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And the locals there, a lot of them had had UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings or stuff. They had never been wanting to talk about it. And mm -hmm. they were just starting to open up and share some of their experiences. It was so heartening to hear them speak about you know what they had experienced. It wasn't just you know listening to to us outsiders come in and tell them you know here's yeah. what's going on in your area, type of thing. So that was really cool, and it was interesting because when I was starting working on my book, I was I went to this writing group and you get critique and all this stuff, and and I started with the chapters on my UFO and my paranormal. And they go, oh, you know, I don't I don't know where you're going with this. I go, well, I don't know, but this is this is my story, <laughs> and then all of a sudden. Uh, there, there was stuff coming out in mainstream media about like the Navy and their UFO stuff. They were finally acknowledging it. And it was around probably Halloween time. So like, so now there's this huge spread on witchcraft and it's like, oh, I get it now. And it's like, so my, my writing group and my writing mentor and the other people in the group is like, yeah, yeah, I see why you're I see why, you know, this isn't so far-fetched. Mm -hmm. So keep writing. It's like, okay, good. Well, I was going to keep writing whether you said to or not, but you know, because I, I wrote the book probably more for me than anybody else. Yeah, yeah. But, um, Which can be quite cathartic to do something like that. It, it was fabulous. And it and, and again, if you talk about relationships and stuff, it was, you know, maybe my daughter doesn't believe everything about my UFO stuff. But, you know, I put her through hell going through all those stepfathers. And so the book for, for nothing else, you know, I'm grateful that it's brought us a lot of healing as mother daughter, oh, that's talk about good. gratitude, and especially me being able to be here in Portland near her, because we can talk about stuff we never talked about back then. It's like, oh, interesting. oh this is how you saw, okay, and this is how, you know, this is why you acted out like that. And, you know, right. and, <laughs> you know, it's just, we can talk about more stuff now than we ever processed then. That, that can, so, right, that can be very right. healing. That can yeah. be very healing. So that's right. And I'm glad you mentioned that too about gratitude. And um, we've got to wrap up. And so, but I want to, I'm going to go back to something I said a little bit earlier. Sure. When you mentioned this about tips and takeaways. And then I've got one more question for you. Um, I just like this when you think about being married multiple times and some horrible husbands and the things that you mentioned. But I think, what are those takeaways? And I like that set better boundaries. And of course, communication gets used a lot, but I don't think you can ever overemphasize communication because there's so many people that don't communicate very well. And um, how you handle the money, which is, I think most people at night that can't sleep, the number one subject is money and they right. don't have enough money or the bills or whatever. And then do you want to have kids or not? That's a gigantic 20 year commitment, so to speak. And then the level of the spirituality. So I think those are some really great reminders for people that maybe are contemplating marriage or long-term relationships and so forth. So, well, let me get to my last question. I always sure. this question for the last, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, what does Joanne Richards know today that she would have liked to have known at 18, that you only get to pick one thing that would have helped you when you were 18? That I am a kick-ass person and I'm worth every good thing that I have coming to me. <laughs> That's good. You know, and it's, it goes back to I was having a conversation earlier today about somebody and it's actually doing a talk. And once again, talking about self-esteem and how important self-esteem is, is, and I'm a kick-ass person and I deserve everything that's coming to me. You're right. Think about how that mindset would have helped you at 18. And it takes yeah. us sometimes decades to learn it and things too. So, well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. This oh, has been so enlightening <laughs> just as I thought it would be. So let me mention every as we wrap up to everybody on the podcast too. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the uh, PS uh, Pacific Daylight Time now on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. 
please subscribe and give me a five star rating if you like what you hear. And also, I do a lot of gratitude coaching. I think people are struggling and they really need some support. And so I offer gratitude coaching for people that want some help and support in any kind of life issues from personal issues to family to personal relationships to their jobs, their finance, their careers, relationships, and so forth. So if you're interested in a 30 minute complimentary consultation, just text coach coach in rather c o a c h i n g to my text number 206-371-8309 that's 206-371-8309 just text coaching and then i'll send you a scheduling link and we can schedule that uh complimentary consultation and also uh people like to get my monday morning minute it's a 60 second video that goes out every monday morning and if you'd like that go also back to your text and text in the number 22828 that's five digits, 22828. Two, and in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and you will get signed up for that. So thank you so much for listening. I'm always happy to have a new guest every week that's got some really neat things to say. Joanne was no exception today. So can I say one last thing? Yes, of course. Oh, sorry. And I just want to give you kudos because even, even doing something as simple as writing down a few things you're grateful for, mm -hmm. if you're in a bad mood, that can just change your mood. So what you're doing is so powerful and, and important. Oh, thank you, Joanne. That's, yeah, that's, it's really important. That, that is yeah. absolutely true. And then I always say to people like the gratitude journal, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers right. you. So writing exactly. it, I am so grateful to Joanne Richards for coming on my podcast and so forth. So great point. Thank you for that unpaid yeah. advertisement. <laughs> You're so, most welcome. <laughs> and so thank you all. We'll see you next week. I am that gratitude guy. Remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.